let me share my screen. Oh, you guys can see that. Hey, um, welcome. If you are joining us for the first time. Oh, I'm not muted. Can you hear me online, you. Carlos? Or somebody online? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, Brenda says they can hear me. So, Carlos, okay, all good. Perfect. Um, so, if you're joining us for the first time, we are the Data Science Institute. Um, this is the introduction to deep learning workshop series. Uh, we meet here every uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. in person at um, hey, the Weaver Science and Engineering Library room 212, or we meet online too on Zoom. All this can be found on the website for Data Science Institute. So also a reminder, um, everything we do, if you didn't, if you missed the class, it's okay. Everything we do is recorded. You just have to remember to go to the wiki page. Um, so you guys might, people who have been in the class before know this, the UA Data Lab GitHub. Um, yeah. so, and uh, GitHub, UA Data Lab, we go to repositories and uh, DL workshops. So we have all the lectures there that the GitHub is mainly for all the IPython notebooks we have been using. The wiki is where you will find slides and all everything else we have discussed so far. Um, so just want to remind you, um, somebody told me they did not even realize we had it. Um, okay, so let's start. I'm gonna start. So the way we are gonna work today is um, if, you're, if you got the emails, uh, uh, to sign up for Cyverse. I hope you all did. Um, but if not, um, I'll paste again on the on the Zoom chat, the link for it. Is there anybody in person who wants the link for sign up for Cyverse, the workshop link? Um, if you already signed up without the workshop link, that's okay. It's just uh, easy for us to coordinate. If you are on the workshop link, I think, yeah, the one in the uh, the one in the email I sent today, the workshop slash one forty one. We just pasted it again on the uh, on the group chat on Zoom. Um, I'll just bring that up here again if you want to see it. So it's like probably in the email is I already sent this out in the email today. It's more for administrative purposes. Um, if you have a more importantly, hopefully you have a Cyverse account by now, and. Before we get into it, I'm gonna go through uh, go through some theory on why we are doing this, and this are some stuff I had discussed with my other class on Tuesday. So basically, we are in an introduction to deep learning workshop, and today we even have a specialist from Cyverse um, who's gonna give us a run through, and he's online. Um, so why are we doing this, right? So even before, so we need to understand how these things work deeply. In the past few lectures, we got a lot of hands-on done, including building our own chatbot over the large language model Llama. But how do these things even work, right? So let me start with the question, um, what is intelligence? What do you think is intelligence? It's an open question, unmute yourself. If you paste on the chat group, let me see if I can see the chat box. Uh, nope, where is the chat box? Lost it again. Yeah, it's better you unmute and just say something because I don't seem to have the technological progress to switch between Zoom windows. Um, never mind. Yeah, I can't see the Zoom window. Uh, so yeah, what is intelligence? Like, what do you guys think is a definition of intelligence? Anybody online, in person? Sure. I'll what do you mean by? I mean, okay, maybe the, the other question is, are, do you think humans are intelligent species? Yeah. Okay, and what is the meaning of that? Why are we intelligent? And let's say a dog is not intelligent. A dog is intelligent in, in its own realm, of course, and sometimes I feel my dog is more smarter than I am, most of the time, or rather she thinks I'm a dog, so it kind of works out. But why do you Think, why do people say humans are intelligent? Let me see if I can. Okay, there's an answer, ability to learn. Okay, ability, that's a fair one. So, but chimpanzees can learn um, 
Okay, Se separate the signal from the noise. Okay. Any other ideas here? Problem. Solve problems. Okay, so does that mean, uh, let's say your computer is intelligent? Yeah. So computer is intelligent, okay. And if a chimpanzee can solve problems, he's intelligent too. Okay, fair. So again, there is no right answer for this, right? So intelligence is a huge gamut of things, the whole spectrum where, you know, official definition is like, hey, there are this bunch of intelligences, you know, if you are familiar with it, there's EQ, IQ, intelligent quotient, uh, there's a Stanford Binet scale, which measures the intelligent quotient, EQ has its own scales. But this is kind of what people have been coming at. You know, if we have linguistic abilities, ability to talk to people and understand the words. So for example, finding the right words to express what you mean, and even other way around, right? Understand uh, living things and people who are around us and what they are telling us. Like a naturalist, you understand things in nature, understand things in pe with other people are talking to you, sensing people's feelings, motivations, everything. So intelligence is a whole gamut of things. Um, so, and the more important question is, do we consider chat GPT as intelligent? Or at least do you consider chat GPT as intelligent? That's my second question. Yes. Couple of yeses, no, I'm trying to find. So, I mean, I think it's probably a spectrum of like what intelligence is versus like- Okay, given this like spectrum that. in front of you, do you think chat GPT is intelligent? Some, well, I don't know. I was gonna say on the higher end of the thing, but you know, it's all relative, I guess. Yeah, probably it can do logical, mathematical things. Cannot do interpersonal, intrapersonal, uh, clearly not intrapersonal, definitely linguistic. Um, and even linguistic, it's a little tricky, right? So, um, I mean, do, do you think it really understands or is it just like, you know, telling you the right words you want to hear? And I lost the chat window again. Hopefully there is no, um, and, and please speak up if you're on, on Zoom. Uh, but anyway, the point I'm trying to make is humans have been trying to make you know, intelligent being since you can remember, like a little history of humankind is that we all started like around 170,000 years ago in Africa, right? Um, and that's probably your old ape man, cro something it's called. Um, so then we, at that point, however, we were not really intelligent. I mean, the definition of intelligence being we were not, um, let's say we were, at that point, we were just making garrulous voices just barely enough to hunt and gather maybe um, but the more interesting part of humanity happens only after when we left Africa kind of moved into like the what we call Middle East you know Himalayan foothills etc and you know this is all like archaeologically historically anthropologically even linguistically proven something happened to humanity around those times and we suddenly became intelligent and the definition of intelligence there is we were we started speaking and understanding a full-fledged language. And there is even a theory called Adamic language, which was apparently the language all humans spoke or whatever little number of humans were there, all spoke one language. And then the dispersal happens and even you know, biblical, biblical scholars would connect that to the Tower of Babel incident, right? So before the whole, the whole Tower of Babel incident happened, there are two theories what happened there, which is one is the uh, continuity theory, which you know the school of thought and the scholars argue that we evolved into developing a full-fledged language, ev evolution including your brain ability, your uh, anatomical, morphological, and physiological need, you know, changes in your body, mostly the vocal cords required uh, to speak words and your intellectual ability to uh, understand what the other person is saying. However, the discontinuity school of thought, of which Noam Chomsky also is a proponent, believes that there was a so-called so uh, divine intervention, or even, I mean, the word divine is very loosely defined. It's more like a superhuman interference. And the whole idea is we, you know, somebody helped us learn intelligence or helped us learn language. Anyway, despite all this, 
the point I'm trying to make here is humanity is kind of very close to that moment in time where we are going to act like divine beings. We are almost creating beings, smaller beings out of metal, bare metal, which can supposedly, you know, be intelligent. If we go by your answers five minutes ago, chat GPT is intelligent, at least it's in some form or definition of it. Um, is it like, is it, is it conscious? Is it, is it, does it understand? Is it sentient? Is it, does it have emotions? We don't know all that, but we are slowly getting there. So if you take a step back and look at what we as a humanity has done, in general, we have been looking at this continuous world around us and trying to create intelligent beings with the discrete tools we have. For example, calculus is a discrete tool. We basically take the entire continuous spectrum of a uh, uh, let's say area of a curve under a curve and we divide it into small pieces and then sum it all up. Same thing with transistors, right? We have transistors because of which, you know, we are stuck with zero and one the way I say it, but that's how we ended up with the whole Boolean logic world, right? So we have been creating approximations of continuous world. So, but remember the world around you is definitely continuous, if not something more than that. And that is a big question. Is it only like difference between discrete versus continuous? Or is there something more intelligent that happens to us when we are in IRL in real life, right? So th which is why humans, you know, using its own discrete tools, we thought, hey, if human brain is considered, you know, composed with all these neurons, why not create it ourselves? And that's how all, you know, the, as you know, the deep learning happened as, as a way to mimic all these neurons and trying to understand how it works. In fact, the very first single layer neural network has existed since 19, actually 56. This paper came a little later too. Um, and we even had uh, Minsky, Marvin Minsky was one of the professors at, at MIT, um, who was also part of the initial growth of the AI network. Uh, if you remember, we even had this, you know, deep blue, oh, you won't remember, you probably won't be born, but it, there in 1995, there was, you know, this computer called deep blue, which was able to beat Gary Kasparov in chess. Uh, but everything was great until around that time that, you know, the, uh, the founder, one of the founders, Marvin Minsky himself came up with this particular problem known as the XOR problem and said, it, the problem was pretty simple. So if you, if you are from a tech background, you might know what this means. If not, it's okay. Essentially, or XOR and not, et cetera, are a few fundamental gates on which computers are built on. And these gates are created now with transistors and stuff. What you're looking at is basically what we call truth table or a graphical representation of it. And this is essentially when the answer to the question, if I give you zero and one, what will you as a machine respond? Or in this case, what will the gate respond with? So in, in case of or, if you give, if, if it'll be, there'll be two inputs, you put the first input to zero, second one to one, you know, maybe it, it might be as simple as yes, electricity and no electricity, and the gate will tell you one. If you give one and one, it'll give you all the greens are one and reds are zero. So until 1995, people, whatever AI we had was very linear, right? What we call a good old AI now, you might have heard terms like support vector machine or even like regression problems. And, you know, at that time, if you give this problem to an AI there, it'll tell you, and the problem is, can you draw a line that separates green from red, like all greens from all reds? Sure, that was easy for R. It's a, I mean, even AI machines, they just, you know, try drawing a line, change the angle of the line, et cetera, until they got the right groups or got the groups right, right? But however, I mean, that's how even like most of the hill climbing algorithms and stuff which were used in the deep blue chess game. However, Marvin Minsky asks this question, great, can you do the same for XOR gate outputs? So if you look at the XOR gate outputs in a graph, your green, like one zero, XOR tells you one zero one, XOR tells you one, you put one and one, the XOR gate will give you zero, zero and zero is zero. Question was simple. How do you divide this into two groups with one line? 
even for humans, that's a very difficult task. Like there is no one line solution. I mean, you can probably put a curved line around it, but you know, remember all the tools until then were linear and we did not have, um, at least we did not have the ability to solve this at that time. And that brought us to what we call AI winter. So this little history of AI is like 1950s to 1960 was when the first AI boom happened. In 1970s, one AI winter happened and AI winter is, you know, at the first one was more like from the funding perspectives, people did not, the common man had no idea this was going and the funding agencies, uh, you know, the gods in DARPA and NSF decided, oh, not worth it. At least by 1980s and 90s, there was a second AI boom we call the age of knowledge representation. So these were expert systems capable of reproducing human decision-making. So again, remember the big analogy, the decision-making was yes or no decision-making. Even in a chess game, it was like, let me imagine the all possible moves discreetly, not discreetly in a mathematical sense, not in a secret sense, but let me try, try if I move this pawn from C4 to C5, what will happen to me at the end of the game? So the machines were able to linearly reproduce human decision-making. Everything was great until the this XOR happened in, and we call it AI winter two. And uh, 97 is Deep Blue Beats Gary Kasparov had got nothing to do with um, the XOR problem, but that just was a vestigial uh, thing from the early models. Anyway, the answer, my point here is, from 1990s to 2010, actually late 2010, nobody heard about AI at all because you know people were trying to solve the XOR problems or at least find machines which were um, used, which could solve the XOR problem. So in 2006, uh, you know, people in, in uh, Toronto, University of Toronto, started developing these ideas, more attachments neural networks. And we will learn that in a second, what do, you, what do I mean by attachments? And then, you know, it just took off. A lot of things came together, you know, architecture was catching up. We had huge machines, we had um, GPUs, everything came together. And right now, you know, of course we have uh, chat GPT, right? So just a little bit of history. I thought you guys should know this since you're in a deep learning course. Um, some terminology, if you hear all this, they are not always interchangeable. Artificial intelligence is usually the bigger umbrella term of which machine learning is a subset and machine learning is also con contains the good old AI, including, you know, regression and those kind of pure mathematical models. Then of course we have deep learning, right? So you know, these are all like uh, the definitions in there are people have commented on what machine learning is, what AI is and what deep learning is. Um, I'll skip that for reading that for the sake of time. And this is where, you know, a rough, if you really want to compare, what do you mean by data science? It's kind of a straddling between the, the implementation and more like machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera. But that's the boring theory part. The more interesting part is where I wanted to introduce some of the core nuts and bolts of deep learning. The first thing is loss function. Uh, we It's called a loss function, but we already saw this. If you remember, this was the cruise control example, which we had seen in the very first class. Uh, and the whole idea was how do the cruise control in cars, how does it work? It works because of this constant uh, feedback mechanism between expected speed and current speed. That's exactly how your neural network works. It's a feedback mechanism between uh, what we call loss function, which is simply a fancy term for difference between the expected value and the current value. And back, back propagation is nothing but the feedback loop. Another component I want you to be aware of is gradient descent. It is basically the mathematics sitting behind how neural network is understanding, or more importantly, there is an assumption here that every data you see was generated by one single formula. It's a, it's a very complicated formula, but we are trying to get to the bottom of it. And so when the neural network starts predicting, we start at the very edge of the nebula, or in this case, you can visualize that as a cone with the center being the dark circle in the middle. 
and the AI model together with all the neurons slowly makes takes this step by step by step and tries to get to the bottom of it. And the bottom place is essentially what happens is what AI predicts is same as the expected prediction. Or in this terms, the AI initially predicts a cat, it's actually a dog, it keeps finding the difference in terms of loss functions, throws it back into the network, math happens, and finally, it predicts, you know, cat as cat and dog as dog. That's when you hit the bottom of this. So that's the math part of it, at least a rough idea of it. Now, this is actually one of the major inventions which actually helped us solve the XOR problem known as activation functions. So, for example, like I said, this tool, Perceptron, has existed since 1956. This was the very first single layer neural network was used in a lot of other tools but we couldn't solve the XOR problems. So people started asking, why are we stuck with linear equations when we can have non-linear equations? So people just, what they did was they took the same neural network and started adding non-linear mathematical functions. And so if you see the big picture, right? We started with the discrete world using discrete tools like straight lines. And now slowly we are trying to make sense of the continuous world by bringing in more Cur cur curvatures or curved functions. And voila, we were able to solve the XOR problem with the new activation functions. A lot of terms, just wanted you to be aware, at least at the end of this series, when you hear all these terms, somebody else says, you should at least know these are the things, nuts and bolts, which goes inside a neural network. And then of course, this is the architectures, right? So this is basically all the uh, hardware GPUs, uh, TPUs, what everything else, that's the hardware side and the software side, people started playing with the definition of deep, basically how deep is deep, right? Which layer has how many neurons and it became just more close to an engineering game at that point. And, you know, there's all these kind of different mesh structure, whatever structure neural network you want, somebody has thought of it. Right now we are in an auto regressive auto encoder mode but I'm sure that's gonna change in a couple of years and people are gonna come up with a new architecture. And that was one, that is one of the other core components. And the other core component is bag of words, right? You, we already encountered this, the way language is taught to the neural network is by taking a sentence and dividing it into each of the tokens. And then we try to make sense out of it. Or in other words, by counting the words and tokens around one word, we are trying to learn language from context. So you might have, so what happened was when we tried projecting the learning or just simply the number of you know, words found around other words, people started realizing that king was very close to queen and man was very close to woman. And voila, now we have a tool to tell machine what meaning is. I mean, albeit we are using only context, uh, but that's a different discussion, right? So here people started realizing, oh, here is a long way, amazing way of telling um, neural networks what human understanding of meaning is. We started seeing patterns like, you know, uh, the capitals were close to the countries, uh, Tokyo was close to Japan, or, you know, the other thing was, uh, what is this? Um, strong is close to stronger and we realize that all of the all of the things all of the meanings which humans understand naturally is already in the language and all we had to do was just tell the machine here are the things which go next to each other and we don't even have to explicitly say it because all we do is take take a big paragraph break it down into sentences and you know start with the frequency and there's a lot of layers to it but Fundamentally, that's what it is, like right? one word and what are the other words around it. So these are a few core components. The other one is, um, I think we already saw this, like the the whole the bag of words, everything we know. And the last core component right now is internet as bag of words, like everything on the internet, right? We throw it all into this neural network and, you know, we do back propagation and thus LLMs were born. Now. The the question is, great, we know the theory, we already did some toy examples, but real life machine learning or AI, uh, deep learning is so much different because remember these guys, the guys who run large language models have access to resources, 
in short, the entire internet, the entire GPUs and CPUs. But how can a common man do this, right? Even like students who don't have money, I'm assuming if you are a billionaire, you won't be a student or at least not paying your own tuition. And either way, if you have money, you can <laughs> quit the class right now. The, the rest of the class is for poor people. Um, so the question is, how do we run these large language models? We cannot do it in our laptop because, you know, if you remember, everything we ran on Colab was minimum 10 GB, the model list itself. Now you're forgetting the data part of it. So every data right now, what we have is at least a couple of hundred GB. And this is a bane of current setup of deep learning because we these large language models really need to see tons and tons of data before they can arrive at that some kind of a subtle pattern, whatever it's learning, right? So these are big questions that have been pertaining to people in academia. Like how do we load a 10 gigabyte 10 GB data set on Colab, right? In Colab, if, I don't know if you played around with it, you can actually have a connection to a little bit of, let me see if I can bring that up. So if you go to Colab, um, there is an inherent connection to um, Google Drive, but that is still limited, right? You can actually get a couple of things from Google Drive. Um, I think you can kind of upload file, um, somewhere you can okay where we have the new time you'll figure this out but my point there is even if you have some data google drive is limited for you it's just only like what 10 gb but you cannot train a you know good neural network on 10 gb data left alone a large language model right so the uh oh we just went back to the wrong slide just give me a second ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. All right, so these are the questions people were asking. How do we get, we on one side, we want the ability to load huge data sets. How do we get more powerful GPUs and memory like RAM, right? So the solution at that time was, let's have a high performance cluster. The high, sure, um, Arizona has a huge high performance cluster. If you haven't accessed it, you should go and play around with it. But that had a couple of restrictions. One, you cannot debug your code on the cluster, right? So like we were doing on Colab, everything on a cluster is you submit a job from the command line, it schedules you up, maybe it'll run today, maybe it'll run tomorrow. But yeah, we got GPUs and we get a decent amount of data. But then we did not have the ability to debug. So there was no one single tool which could do all this for you and be also free, right? Until uh, this came up. But sure, you can now do all this in AWS, but 10 years ago, this was the only tool which did that when it was invented. And surprise, surprise, it was invented in the University of Arizona. And right now it's competing with AWS SageMaker and Azure, competing in the sense it's at par with all that, gives you everything what we needed, like huge data storage, huge machines, and more importantly, the ability to debug your code on a high performance cluster, that's huge. Like you just cannot do that because most of these high performance clusters work on something known as Docker, which is almost like a computer sitting inside a computer. And it's a complete black box. You can almost never debug a Docker component, right? You click a button, it runs. We don't know if it runs or not, why it runs. But Cybers also provides this the ability to debug your code live on the system. So which is why I wanted to introduce Cybers because I, at least I do not know a, any other free open source software which will get you all this. Also, another thing you might, I will introduce in the next class is Jetstream. So Jetstream is this NSF uh, new computing system. Also like goes hand in hand with Cybers. And the idea is we will, you can get an A100, uh, GPU just as a student. You cannot do that anywhere. Like you can use a student, you just write one paper and it'll give you A100. Um, if you don't know, A100 GPUs are like, I think state of the art at this point, right? So anything state of the art, you can just go, you know, write a paper here in Jetstream. I mean, clearly you are not getting it to take it home, but more interestingly, you get to run code on it. So there's a huge push from, you know, the gods of NSF and funding agencies to realize that, you know, we are 
constantly moving towards the world of closed systems, right? With all people trying to make money, sure, makes sense. Corporates wants to make money, but what do students do? Or what do labs which don't have so much ability do? So which is why people are pushing on cybers and I'm not pushing it only because you know, I'm from U of A, but it's it actually is a pretty good tool. And a lot of people, I think they already have close to 500K subscribers or people using it. It's a huge beast. Now, enough of the pitch, right? Let's go. Okay, this is the goal for today. We might not get to it. Uh, Fine-tune Llama with Cybers is the goal. But at this point, I want to hand it over to Michele, if you're still there in the call, Michele, to give a quick introduction and tour to Cybers. Even if we don't get to the fine tuning part, uh, we will do it next time. Where are we on the Zoom link? Michele, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, Check, if people one, stop two, sharing, three. then I can uh -huh. share my own screen here. Hey, Michele, I think you are unmuted or wait, I am not hearing. Hello? Okay, perfect. We hear you. Cool. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Mithun, can you please stop sharing? I know, man. I've been trying to do that for the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> can, maybe you should, I'm telling you, the more degrees I have, I'm going down on the intellectual scale. It's um, okay. As long as you're it, doing what you're supposed to do. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. All, All right. right. Your turn. Uh, let okay. me bring up this so screen. for the interest of time, I'm not going to keep this much long, but I am Michele Cosi. I am a data scientist for cybers here at the University of Arizona, and I'm going to give you a very brief inter introduction, excuse me, very brief introduction to what cyber is and what cybers has been for me from my point of view. And I would also like to point out that here today on the call is Nirav, and Nirav is the big boss of Cybers, or one of the big bosses of Cybers. So I'm a little bit put on the spot. And Nirav, if I say something wrong, please, you are very welcome to step in and pitch in your two cents. So Cybers but, was originally called iPlant, and it was Nirav's baby. Sorry, Nirav, yes, I exactly. let you take over. Exactly. I come from the plant sciences and from the plant science world and uh, I plant very much suited me, but roughly in 2016, there was a lot of interest from using this uh, platform outside of the plant world. And uh, it changed the name from I plant to cybers, these two help people that were not in the plant and may have felt a little bit left out. I'm going to be sharing my screen right now and uh, talk to you a little bit about what we can do as well as showing you a little bit about how it works. So, oops, my bad, excuse me, this way. So Mithun did a pretty good introduction to well there is resources out there but hey are they all free well no but what can we do about it here at the university okay, are you sharing already no not yet okay that was that was my little spiel right as i was about to share we do not sure. have up to 500,000 people but we do have at least 110,000 people helped publicize at least 1,500 publications, and we hold roughly 11 petabytes of data. This is all uh, data that people have uploaded, that they have worked on, as well as we are storing in case uh, for DOIs, for example. And we also run trainings, and we have trained up to 40,000 people in the past uh, eight, nine, or more years, too. So. The idea of all of this is, well, there is a lot of laboratories that need to carry out heavily, computationally heavily, computationally heavy, excuse me, computationally heavy data analysis, however, don't have the computation for it. So back when Cybers was I planned, the idea was, okay, what is the technologies that we can leverage in order to create a platform for people to access online in order to um, make use of the internet, essentially. Um, cloud computing. 
essentially, so that they can carry on and do their data analysis. Here at the U of A, we have a very powerful HPC. So if people already know how to use the HPC, I'm going to say go right ahead. But if your laboratory does not have access to the HPC, or maybe you don't need all of the power of the HPC, we have Cybers here. And Cybers is a fantastic place for uh, you to access things like our studio or Jupyter Labs and carry out your, uh, your research. We have different divisions of Cybers. We are now creating and uh, starting Cybers Health, uh, which will deal with HIPAA data. And we also have Cybers Defense and uh, well, Cybers, we also help in the professional world. But what does it mean for students, graduate students and people in academia? Well, um, we help with doing science. Uh, that's the, I remember when there were a conference, there was a conference and uh, people are running in front of your booth and they're asking, what do you do? Well, we help scientists do science, but how do we do it? Well, we do this by leveraging uh, the cloud infrastructure. So we have compute through something called the discovery environment and through Kakao, we also orchestrate a number of uh, cloud providers such as Access, AWS, Google Cloud. We talked about Jetstream very briefly and Kubernetes. The entirety of Cyber is actually very well orchestrated with Kubernetes. And what about storage? What do you do with storage? Cyber has a very big data storage and um, all of this data connects with one another. So you can have storage and date, data processing in the same uh, space. And this is all done through something called iRODs, which is the connective tissue that holds the storage and the data analysis together. Then why do we want to do this? Well, because we wanted to uh, tackle a technological bottleneck where we give people easiness of use while still give them the flexibility of really big uh, data processing platforms. So without further explaining what can Cybers do or the various things that Cybers can give you, I'm just going to show you how easy it could be to be on Cybers and to get uh, started on a Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to go to the discovery environment and you can go to the discovery environment through uh, the de.cybers.org um, URL. And here on the left, you have your access menu where you have your home, if you click on home, you can, it will show you how much you have used, how much CPU consumption you have done, and uh, the amount of analysis you have run uh, throughout your entire time in Cybers. You can access your data store, which is essentially where you add your data. And the data store can be accessed through the command line interface or through something called CyberDuck. And CyberDuck allows you to um, navigate your data store through a uh, for an application on your computer and you can also run applications these are apps such as jupyter lab rocker uh, our studio ubuntu desktop vs code and also a cloud shell for this exercise today I am going to start a jupyter lab I I, I was looking earlier for a PyTorch um, application that uh, we have integrated. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because we I know that we will be needing GPUs. So this JupyterLab PyTorch is an application with GPU support. And uh, if you go up here in the search bar, just type in PyTorch, select the first thing that comes along. We don't worry about this right here on the top, the bottom left. Uh, we have, uh, version of Ubuntu 20.04. And all I'm going to do is that I'm going to go through uh, some setup process and then launch the application itself. Here is asking me what the analysis name can uh, is. I'm just going to leave it as 
standard. So I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to change analysis name and, or change the output folder. And here in the next phase, I'm going to ask whether I want to have a minimum amount of CPUs, um, disk space, RAM, memory. And you can see if you look at uh, min minimum memory, you can set up up to 250 gigabytes of RAM memory just by clicking around. This is not necessarily uh, something that you have to pay for. This is something uh, that uh, you can access for free as a University of Arizona student and uh, um, faculty member or professor. Same with CPUs, you can get up to a minimum of 128 uh, cores and also a maximum cores if necessary and amount of minimum disk space for this specific um, analysis that you are going to be running. I'm not going to touch any of it simply because I'm just showing. So if I were to just click next, and uh, uh, one second, everything. Michele, is the Jupyter Py Lab PyTorch, is that something only you can access? Or can yeah. you just show how did you get there again? Uh, people oh, no problem. Wanting... So um, I'm receiving uh, I'm receiving messages on Slack telling me that the current Elasticsearch is down. But if I were to copy this and put it in the chat, you should be able to get to uh, this application itself. It, as you can see, if I were to uh, just the open up a new, a new tab and just paste it in, you will be redirected to the JupyterLab PyTorch. And here, I'm going to go. Yeah, hold on. Through. Okay. Uh, you mean like click on slash apps, is it? DECyverse.org slash apps. That's how we get I, there. I posted a link in the in the chat. You should be able to click that. Oh, but the problem is people in person do not have the access to the Oh, room. okay. So I was trying to do a little bit of an advanced search here. So if you can't reach to uh, PyTorch, just go to the apps on the left. So I'm just going to do the same thing. Go to the apps on the left and um we have here a few Jupyter Lab uh, choices, and I'm just going to go with uh, the Jupyter Lab Geospatial, uh, simply because that's something I have helped with integrating. And I'm just going with three points. Actually, no, I'm just going to go with latest. I can choose the the version. The unable to search sheets on popping up. Just don't worry about it for now. And I'm just going to go click next. It's going to ask for an input parameter. Don't worry about it for now. Just click next. If you want to, you can select um, minimum and maximums. I'm just going to click next. And once I am to the Jupyter Lab Geospatial launch um, launch page, I'm just going to click launch analysis. So I'm just going to click launch analysis, and it's going to show me the launch page here you have a small little button that says go to analysis click on go to analysis and here it will show you um, the application essentially running if it gets stuck at 60 percent it's quite normal it's simply it's that it's downloading the container image and it needs to open the image, but it shouldn't take more than a couple of seconds. And all of a sudden you have a functional Jupyter lab. Um, also quick, if you are new to Cyverse, you might find it to be slow, but it's really not slow because of the lack of processing power. It's because it's so distributed that things need time to get from one side of the you know hard disk let's call it a hard disk but a disk distributed hard disk to the other so just be a little patient uh yeah just wanted to mention yeah there is one thing that nirav in the chat points out that the gpu is not open to all this is something that is true and what i was trying to launch over here with the pytorch is a Jupyter Lab with uh, GPU support. So I'm launching the PyTorch here, and here I have the 
geospatial Jupiter. If I were to go to the terminal here and type in NVIDIA SMI, it will tell me that, well, there is no NVIDIA driver being found. But if I were to be launching the PyTorch, just a second, let, let's wait for it to launch, go to the terminal and do the same exercise. And just type in NVIDIA SMI, I have a GPU. So what does this mean? We have a very powerful, here at the U of A, we have a very powerful platform. And you, if you request access to a GPU, write to us and we could give you a really powerful platform with GPU support that you could use in order to uh, train yourself in uh, how to use your, sorry, do your analysis um, without having to install um, or go through the process of getting a more expensive computer for your laboratory. We have this ready for you and you can use this in your own time. So I'm going to stop here, Mithun, and give it back to you. And um, I'm not sure whether you need the GPU's access today, but if you can go ahead and just use the applications that are available to you through the apps, then you should be able to do everything that you require. Can you show data okay. sharing? I don't know, Nirav, I do not know if that will be um, for today, for example. I don't know if we have time for that today. But otherwise, yeah, I, th I think one yeah. thing that the University of Arizona, as we are going through uh, the data lab, um, classes and workshops, one thing that is popping out more is people's more reason, reason, more interest in cybers. So eventually we'll have a proper cybers introduction uh, to more people. And there we can probably show how to share data. So I'm going to stop sharing for now. Okay, yeah, we'll probably have another cyber session pretty soon, um, and I will probably don't have too much time today. Um, so essentially, you you guys probably might be here already, right? You will be seeing this window and everything we did on Colab, you can start doing here. You can go to all our code bases from the last previous classes. Oh, yeah, terminate analysis. Good point, Carlos. So now there is one other thing you need to know about cybers is that you can only launch, well, at least when, only launch two windows at a, at a time. Let's call it two apps at a time, right? You can have one of the Jupyter Lab geospatial analysis, and the other one is, let's say, PyTorch running. You try adding one more, um, you you it won't allow you at least when you join as a basic uh, at the basic tier that you're joining in. But that's okay. You, all you have to do is come back here and kill one of the tasks you have been working on right now. So that should give you one free and my point is you almost never need more than two because if you are already into that and the analysis window, it'll give you a bunch of these options from here itself. So yeah, um, you can start with IPython and you can even have a terminal right there. Everything It's almost like an operating system in itself, this window alone, right? So we can at least everything you want to load. And I I will let you guys play around with this at home and go back to all the code we have been writing and see if you want to try running it there, all including the chat bot. I was hoping to get to fine tuning today, but I don't think we'll have time for that. There's no point starting it now. Uh, but remember, yeah, you can like upload whole, okay huge amounts of data. And more importantly, you might want to look at, um, you know, go to Cyber's documentation, right? Cybers.org. Uh, and you can actually find out a lot about how to transfer data. So transfer data, cybers. I use something known as go commands, but it's a long list of things you can uh, use. Um, and the go, I don't know if you guys know about this language. Golang is, okay, let me say this way. I think C is the best language in the world, C programming, uh, until I met Go. So if you if you know the history in computer science, everything close to metal, the closer you are to the metal, the faster you will be. Um, that's why people were writing in assembly language first, and then people were writing in C. So anything that is functional fast in real time system, it is at some point written in C or cross compiled into C until Go 
came up, right? And Go is this amazing, you know, language came from Google a couple of years ago. In fact, Dennis Ritchie, who, who originally created C, was the one who created Go language. So it's the same set of people. And this is a, this is a very Python level, high, what we call a high level language, very user friendly, but also compiles close to the metal. Anyway, I'm giving you all the spiel on um, that because most of the commands in Cybers to send data across is also written in Go, and Go is kind of very powerful. Like, you know, it's uh, normally you would use whatever you time you will take to upload data. This will be like one by tenth of it. So I suggest you read on a little bit, play around with all the Cybers commands and documentation. Um, and let me open the floor for questions or at least look at the questions in the, so there is, yeah, terminate analysis. We talked about that. Is Cybers for the lie? Okay, that's different. GPU is not open to all. Okay, did you say uh, Jung Mi Park, were you able to log into Cybers? It says, it says you are not authorized. Maybe nobody approved your workshop request. But it other worked. than that, yeah. okay, perfect. Um, sharing data, sharing apps. Okay, yeah. Okay, if you're part of it, let we'll probably have a little bit more uh, details in, in the next class. Also, uh, sharing data, and my goal is to show you, you know, how to load one of your big data sets because if you remember, all the data we have been seeing is in text format, and text is like. You know, it's it's not gonna go beyond a couple of GBs, uh, even if even the biggest data sets. But remember, the real world is not just text; it has the whole multimedia, and that is where all of these things are gonna come into picture. Especially if you work in like a, you know, if you wanna go read or research into a lot of computer vision based things, like you know, if you're interested in having your own Dali, Dali, and um, what a thing called. Uh, whatever that thing is, the one which smartly brings you a lot of pictures from the text you provide uh, mid mid journey, right? Mid journey. Those kind of stuff, if you want to play around with it, all of that is available, of course, on Hugging Face, but you know, it kind of assumes you have um, you have the ability to run it, but this now you do. Now you have the ability to so take everything under here, like object detection, depth estimation, like text is actually very easy, which is why if you remember, I started with text and slowly going into the other ones like text to video and all those interesting things. But you know, any data set in multimedia is starts at a GB, if not TB. Um, so, and like, welcome to Cybers. It's created to handle that kind, that level of processing and data uh, and free. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let any other questions right now? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like a Jupyter notebook. It's a collab. It's just a collab, right? The one you opened is completely collab. It's it's Jupyter sitting in there. So everything you do will completely happen exactly same. It's collab by us for research people. Everything pip install. Everything goes same. And Jupyter is like everything collab wraps and uh, does a sandbox for you. Cybers does that for you too. Well, at least you have Cybers now. When I was a student, we were literally pushing jobs to high performance cluster, and which is you cannot debug through it. So, okay, any other question? If not, we'll adjourn for the day. Uh, what is another link there? AI tools. Uh, is this? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So the our this is another um, repository you might want to keep uh, watch out for. So we have a lot of these, you know, constantly updated AI tools landscape website, UA Data Seven um, slash Learning Resources. And in fact, here itself we have the learning resources. Right. Where is that? Um, I remember seeing the was it in the wiki like a huge amount of learn. Data lab uh, in the wiki? No? Yeah, just the, the this these two repositories, UA Data Lab and UA Data 7, is pretty well maintained and they all have the latest 
list of resources to learn. Like you can read if you enjoy just reading and playing around with things. This is your like constantly anything new happens. It's posted here. Okay. Um, that's all we have for today. Um, let's see. We'll probably next week is Thanksgiving, is it? No. Yeah. So we probably won't meet next week, is it? Are we? Do we have class on Thursday? No. no? Okay. Thursday. All right. Cool. Okay. So we won't meet next week. We'll meet in two weeks, and hopefully you would have played with cybers by then, and we will try to get some our hands dirty with some big data and big processing. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Michele, for this wonderful introduction. It was amazing. Bye.